Thank you very much, Mark. And good morning to you all. It is great uh, to see you all here this morning. Before we come to God's word, let us pray to our Heavenly Father. Gracious Father, Sovereign God, give us ears to hear your word this morning. May your Holy Spirit work in our hearts to transform us to be more like Christ. Father, by the Spirit's power, may you enable us to be doers of your word and not just hearers so that your name is glorified, that your name is honoured, that your name is lifted high and the world would know through us that you are God, our God, our Father, our Saviour, our Lord and our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as we come to God's word this morning, we see that John is writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ. Fellow followers of Jesus. Fellow children of God. Christians. And he wants to encourage them to live out their lives for the glory and praise of God. To the one who has called them from darkness to light. And this is my desire this morning too. To encourage us all to live out our lives for the glory and praise of God. In order for me to encourage you this morning, I have to ask some probing questions. And you are going to have to go from here And spend some time before God in prayer. Before his word to answer them truthfully if you want to be encouraged. Either encouraged to carry on as you are. Praying for more strength to do the will of God. Or encouraged to come before God in repentance and seek his mercy and grace upon your life my first question is this what are you here for this morning I think most of us uh, could quite easily answer that question Uh, it wouldn't take much maybe you would say something like I'm here to, to worship God of course to praise his name I'm here to learn to be taught and fed from the word of God I'm here to give my tithes and my offerings to my God These are good things. In fact, the Bible commands us to do these things. But there is something much more that we need to do as Christians, as a child of the living God. And as John reveals more about what it means to be a child of God, I have to ask a few more questions to help us think more about why we come to church. And again, we need to take these thoughts away from here this morning and pray over them and come before God's word with them to ask God for help by the power of the Holy Spirit to submit to the authority of God's word so that we can live lives to the praise of and glory of God. This is something we all need to do. Because we have to continually scrutinise our lives by the word of God. Because our hearts can be deceitful beyond measure. And we can even deceive ourselves. Thinking that we are in the will of God. But clearly we are acting contrary to scripture. So here are a couple more questions to help us think about why we come to church. As the family of God comes together, 
Do you come with the intention of loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or do you think that the church is just here to serve you? Or do you come to the gathering of the brethren knowing that there is hatred in your heart towards a brother or sister in Christ and expect God to still bless you? Also, I would ask anyone here this morning who is not a part of a church and you say that you are a Christian, I would challenge you and ask, do you think it is acceptable to just turn up to church on Sunday, leave and not be part of a family church life during the week and call yourself a child of God? These are really the kind of questions we need to be asking ourselves all the time. All these questions, I think, boil down to one question, which is this. Do you bring life or death to the body of Christ this morning? What do you leave behind you once you have left? This is the severity with which John is writing to the church. Are you a giver of life or are you a murderer? We're not talking about perfection. We all get things wrong at times. I know I do. We aren't always going to say the right thing. We all know that. But what is the intention of of our heart what is the motive behind what we do what drives us you may think I am overreacting but we would do well to remember that we are before the very word of God this morning and as Hebrew 4 12 to 13 tells us the word of God is living and active Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is God's word that we are before this morning. And we need to surrender to it. We need to submit to God's authority, not our own. And God says there are only two camps, which we are told of uh, just before our, our reading this morning up in verse 10. By this it is evident that who are children of God and who are children of the devil Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Hear God's word this morning. The way we act speaks bundles about our faith. Our actions prove our faith. This is what John is trying to teach the churches that he is writing to. How can people say that they love the Lord like the false teachers of his day, but hate their brothers and sisters in Christ who have been brought with the same precious blood of Christ? How can you say, oh, I love the Lord, but don't really want anything to do with the body of Christ, the ones for whom the Lord Jesus gave his life for? This is the way the Bible speaks about us as Jesus' disciples. We are together the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. As Ephesians 4 states, we are to speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 
We are commanded to love one another. This is not a choice. This is a command. And from the beginning, we have known this command. As verse 11 states. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. This shouldn't have been a shock to anyone, Jew or Gentile. God has been commanding this of his people from the beginning. Leviticus 19, we read in that chapter, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbour, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus said in John 16, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. How can we be sure, though, that we are a Christian? How can we be sure that we are walking in the will of God? How can we we know that God dwells in our hearts by the Holy Spirit? How can we know all this? Because we doubt ourselves, don't we, at times? We have this inner turmoil going on in our hearts sometimes. We we question our salvation. We doubt that, that God is with us. But John says there is a way to know that you belong to God. By loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what John says. Look at verses 23 and 24 of 1 John chapter 3. And this is his commandment. That we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ. And love one another. Just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. You want an example of the most Spirit-filled, Christ-like, God-fearing person? Look for a 1 John 3.16 person. By this we know love. That he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is the godly person. This is the Christ-like person. One who lays down his life for the body. James says in his letter, Now this, know this, sorry, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James carries on and says, Be doers of the word, not only hearers, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, But a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. As I've already said, our actions prove our faith. What do your actions say about your faith? 
An easy one for us to think about is our speech. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our brother James goes on to warn us. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And he also says in chapter 2 of his letter, but some, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And James's reply to this is, I will show you my faith by my works. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We are called by God to love one another. And this is what we should be wrestling to do. This is what we should be striving to do every day. To show love to one another. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is a way of life. Not just something we can do in a couple of hours on a Sunday morning. We have to think of it like this, in this way. Because this is what we're saved for. This is why Christ died for us. So we could be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to live lives to the glory and praise of God. Not our own. What is opposite to this way of of life giving? It is to be like Cain. As verse 12 says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. You are of the evil one and of the world if you hate your brethren. There is no excuse for this behaviour. But if you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation and do the commands of Christ, your actions justify your faith and you are considered righteous in Christ. It is not your works that save you, but they show who you have faith in, like Abel did. We have to see that our actions either condemn us or justify us. Jesus warns us in Matthew 5, 21 to 26, he says this, You have heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift. Leave it there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. All of us need to hear the warnings against ungodly behaviour within the body of Christ this morning. But we must also hear the encouragements. In verse 14 he says this, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. We can take great comfort from God's word this morning that the Spirit of God is at work 
in our hearts if we love the brothers. But there is another warning as we carry on reading verse 14. Whoever does not love his brother abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This is the word of Almighty God. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. O oh God, have mercy on us. Give us ears to hear your word this morning. Jesus said in Matthew 5, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is serious. There, there, there will be some here who, who are bitter, who, who are angry, who, who are jealous, who slander others in the body of Christ, who gossip about them. But all these things, they lead to death. Death for those who bring them and death to those who hear them. Therefore, we, we must let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from us along with all malice. Instead, we must be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave us. We have to be concerned how we speak to one another, how we act towards one another, and ask the question again. Do I bring life or death to the body of Christ when the people of God come together? Do I speak well of the church when I'm away from it? We have seen the things that bring death to the body of Christ. But how do we bring life? Life and love. Look at verse 16. By this then we know love, that he, that's Jesus Christ, he laid down his life for us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave his life for you, for me. We did not deserve it, but he did it because he loves us, because we are his bride, we are his treasured possession. He gave his all for us. He was poured out to death, even death on a cross for us. So therefore, we ought to be willing to lay our lives down for our brothers and sisters. None of us deserve to be saved. It is by grace and mercy alone. And this sacrificial love needs to be seen in all of our lives. Not just in our time, not just with our words, but also in our finances. Look at verses 17. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? I had quite a, quite a colourful upbringing, shall we say. Uh, I remember someone telling me uh, that, that if ever you wanted to get revenge on someone, you don't have to hurt them physically. What you have to do is, is hit them where it really hurts, in their wallets. Damage their things so they have to depart with the thing that they value the most. Their money. 
This is where their security is found. This is the thing that they most trust in. What do you value the most? John goes on to say in verse 18, numbering himself with the body of Christ. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. From verses 16 to 18, John is showing us that a true Christian, that a Christ-like faith can only be lived out if we are part of a body of believers in Jesus Christ. We cannot, sorry, how can we look like Christ if we are not involved in each other's lives? How can we know the needs and the cares of our brothers and sisters if we do not meet together on a regular basis? Hebrews 10, 23 to 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How do you join your brothers and sisters in prayer for the body of Christ, for their needs, if you don't come to the prayer meetings, if you don't go to home groups, if you don't take part in church events that are going on? How can we love like Christ if we're not involved in a church? It doesn't have to be this one, but a church. We have to ask ourselves, are we involved as much as we could be? Are we really bothered? What is the real desire of our hearts? Maybe you're you're more affluent than others and you are able to support the church by giving. But by just giving, you feel that you can keep the church at arm's length and not be actually physically involved. But the word of God calls us to be like Christ, to shine forth with this self-sacrificial love that Christ has shown us. And this is a call to every one of us just as John includes himself there in verse 18. We are all called to do this as God's children, to be imitators of Christ to one another. We together are the bride of Christ. We have been pulled out of darkness into his marvellous light. Let us shine like Christ to one another. It's going to be hard. It's going to cost us a lot. But don't forget what Jesus taught. In Matthew 5, he says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we seek to be like Christ, 
We have to put to death the desires of the flesh. We have to do battle with our sinful nature. The world will hate us. It will mock us and ridicule us just like it did Christ. But we mustn't forget all that Christ has promised to us. We will be with our Saviour in glory. We are not striving towards an empty goal. We will enter into the eternal rest to be with our God forever. Where his glory will be our light. We must keep our eyes on the prize. Jesus is the bridegroom and he will come out to meet his bride, us, the church. And until that day, we must strive to do all that we can to prepare the bride for her saviour. And if you are doing all that you can to prepare the bride of Christ for that day, verse 19, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. As we come down to verse 20, uh, there is some ambiguity in the Greek text uh, and scholars go back and forth to state their points about this verse. But some scholars believe that the Spirit of God has allowed this ambiguity in the text for a reason. And I have to agree with it because it all has to do with how you approach it. What is your mindset before you approach this verse? Verse 20. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. If you read these verses, knowing that your heart condemns you, if you know that there is hatred towards your brother in your heart, get on your knees before God and beg for mercy. Because God is greater than your heart, And the condemnation you will get from him is far worse than you can ever imagine. Run back to chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And chapter 2. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hear God's plea to you this morning. Repent, confess your sins to him, and ask for forgiveness. Because God knows everything. God knows how deep that sin is in your heart. There is no fooling him for a second. You need to repent of your sin and all God will treat you as a murderer and no murderer has eternal life. Or maybe your heart is is condemning you even though you know you've tried to do God's commands. And if this is how you approach these verses, we can reassure our hearts before our sovereign God that he is above our hearts and he knows everything. He knows the true intention of our hearts. We can, we can mull over scenarios in our head again and again, but in the end we have to trust who our heavenly father is that he is gracious and merciful and that there is grace and mercy to be found he knows our frame he knows we are weak and we can rest assured in chapter 1 verse 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and chapter 2 as well if anyone does sin We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are not 
perfect. But we are striving to love the church in deed and in truth. And beloved, let me close this morning encouraging you to strive on to love one another with the same love that Christ has shown us by reading verses 21 to 24. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Amen. Amen.